Okay, so with us today is uh, David Hansen, whose bio you can basically read behind me, as it turns out. Um, so he's a PhD in interactive arts and engineering, an interdisciplinary PhD, but you'll find him extremely knowledgeable across a wide range of technological and non-technological things that relate to robotics. And in fact, uh, I've never seen anybody quite like him, in the sense that in the area of robotics, He's really, he really seems to have just sort of taken on the need to learn all of these different pieces to put an amazing puzzle together, rather than building them from sort of, you know, going out and finding somebody who's already figured this out or finding somebody who's figured that out. At the very least, he's given himself enough, enough knowledge to go out and figure out who he does need to fill in different pieces of the puzzle. But he's also created a lot of this stuff himself, learning a lot of different areas in the process. So it's very cool, and it's uh, wonderful to introduce you today. So, David Hansen. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I am very excited about the work that you are doing here at the university and the organiz organizations established here. And Hong Kong is a wonderful center um, to do this sort of work and a, a hub of technology innovation, commerce, manufacturing, um, and uh, I happen to be manufacturing one of my robots um, at a factory based out of Hong Kong. So um, uh, I uh, have developed many human-like robots and robot characters, which include small character robots like uh, Zeno and highly realistic robots like, like our portrait of Einstein. Um, uh, and the integration of numerous technologies, including new skin material technologies, which I invented, and some uh, technologies for the materials I co-invented, the facial expression techniques for um, realizing highly realistic facial expressions, fusing those expressions with the biped walking robot bodies, and um, the integration of numerous uh, computer vision and artificial intelligence, speech recognition <coughs> uh, technologies, um, and the development of some natural language processing and generation technologies and understanding um, uh, to realize these characters. So in the video demos that you saw, uh, we were doing real-time speech recognition interactions. Um, uh, some of the interactions are kind of based on scripts and some are unscripted. And I'm going to describe to you um, the techniques and technologies um, for realizing these as works of art and uh, works of uh, technology innovation. Um, a little more about my background. Um, I, I got a, in, the interdisciplinary PhD, which uh, involved cognitive science and neuroscience and some computer science and um, some mechanical engineering, uh, but also philosophy and art. And my undergraduate degree is actually art. I did some science and engineering in undergrad and um, won a couple of awards, but my BFA was actually film video animation from a school called the Rhode Island School of Design. So after that, um, I worked as a professional sculptor for two years, actually. Um, so I'll show you some of. So these are some examples of the sculptures that I did. Um, so uh, big Disney sculptures, I worked professionally for Disney and Universal Studios. And I also worked um, for uh, this casino resort project called the Atlantis Casino Resort and did these sculptures. So these are just a few examples of paintings, drawings, sculptures. Um, so I, sort of bring some of these um, uh, insights as an artist. I, mean, I never studied sculpture, it just came naturally to me. So, um, uh, you know, likewise with, with drawing. I mean, you've got to practice some, but, um, but the ability to see and think about um, aesthetics and, and what facial expressions mean um, uh, can come intuitively. I mean, we do this intuitively. We r read um, uh, what a character may be feeling in an animated movie. And we do this without um, thinking of the formal psychology of what's happening. But by bridging the disciplines, we can extract that implicit knowledge that's hardwired into us and turn it into a discipline where we can then automate the characters and make them come to life. And that's kind of my big, my big vision. So um, there's uh, many robots that are built around the world that are that are absolutely fantastic. Factory robots, bomb disposal robots are coming along. Um, you've got uh, uh, vacuum cleaner robots that are quite famous. And none of these need a human-like identity. In fact, you know, it would just be superfluous 
So there's the question, why even bother with a human-like form? We could, we could make them look like, um, look like uh, fuzzy animals or something, right? We could make them look like anything um, except humans. But <clears throat> we may want to consider the fact that we're hardwired for human-to-human -human, uh, perception. And even when we're reading animals or cartoon characters, we're using these perceptual filters that are built into our brain, these processes for processing face-to-face -face interactions between people. And it's found that newborn babies respond to facial expressions. Neonates will recognize um, the human form and respond positively to that above, above all else. Three-month-old infants use the same uh, portions of their brain to process faces, facial expressions, and gestures that are um, as, as adults do. So, um, so this is really hardwired into us. Um, and uh, it's also shown that, um, that the human visual cortex, a huge uh, percentage of the human brain, is um, used for processing social interactions, social engagements. And um, all of that is activated by the perception of the human face and the human form. So in other words, it's a very high bandwidth way of communicating that we have hardwired into our brain. So if we can tap into that natural high bandwidth uh, communication channel, we may be able to get more information in and more information out. And that can be done abstractly or it can be done very realistically. So this is a piece of artwork by an artist named Ron Muick. And obviously it's very realistic. It's sort of hyper-realistic. It's, it's huge, it's, it's five feet tall. No real face is five feet tall, right? So it's kind of bigger than real. It's more real than real. And the same thing is true with the um, expressions. So the human brow doesn't usually actually knit up like that. That is actually a hyper um, uh, expression, a super normal stimuli, if you will. So in a sense, even though it's got all the attributes of, of re reality, it's still a cartoon. It, is, it still winds up being a cartoon. It's, it's, um, it's extra real, realer than real. So, um, we know from uh, daily experiences that we are hardwired for these kinds of face-to-face -face interactions. Um, now, uh, we sort of generalize, we may generalize these as characters. Um, so characters uh, take this hardwiring for um, processing uh, social attributes and um, faces and bodies and um, externalizes that in artificial media. Right? It could be an animation, or it could be a fictional character in a novel. But you are using all of that um, hardware for processing social identity um, with completely artificial life forms. So this is an interesting paradigm for computing, character computing. And it, in the process um, of taking what is conventionally done by artists and formalizing it, we may come up with better models of how people socialize. So you may be able to find um, this this very powerful interplay between cognitive psychology, neuroscience, art, and engineering by making these characters come to life. So um, now, if we did engineer um, robots and agents to look like characters, and they're evolving over time, right? They may be getting smarter. Then think about this. We may be raising them in the human family to be able to communicate with us, to share our, our, our our ideals, our values. So in this sense, they're raised among us. They're not aliens. If they ever do achieve human level consciousness, um, then they may be lovable. They may be able to earn our love. So already we have artificial characters that can earn people's love and respect. People fall in love with fictional characters all the time. They make you cry. They make you feel things when you see them in the cinema. And um, this is, these characters aren't real. They were dreamed up by a writer, a director, and realized by actors and animators. So um, this hard wiring drives our attraction to these kinds of fictional characters. Um, and that has been the case throughout history, throughout the um, archeological record of the human existence. We find forms that were derived from from humans, as far as we know, stories have been told um, s since you know prehistory. So, um, so this uh, this basically is um, going to be extended in a very powerful way if we can um, make AI-driven characters um, come to life like protagonists, and they already are. This this trend is happening. 
So you've got major industries that are building around AI-driven characters. Um, in movies, the state-of-the-art way of generating crowd effects in the background. Pretty much any non-speaking character in animated movies, um, uh, more likely than not, are driven by um, AI-driven uh, animation. Uh, so um, in this particular case, it's a software called Massive Software from New Zealand. And uh, all of these penguins in this movie Happy Feet were, um, were agents that used fuzzy logic and some uh, motivational system. They had drives. If they, went in, if they were, were encountered a, a change in stimuli, in, in stimuli, then they would change their behavior accordingly. And it looks really alive. It feels alive when you watch these characters. They seem motivated. If, you, if a car another character comes at them in an affectionate way, they may respond affectionately if they know that particular character. Um, if a character comes at them fighting, then they fight back. So this is one example. Game agents, game AI is a big industry. And, and there's a demand for smarter AI in games. And it's really driving some progress. Customer service agents, like interactive voice response systems, are driven by these AI systems. Uh, animatronics and theme parks is known. Robotic toys are exploding. Um, you have education, military, hard um, and serious games for, for military applications, um, et cetera. So you have um, these kinds of intelligent character machines cropping up everywhere, from virtual characters to toys, animatronics. When you add up these industries, it's billions of dollars, billions of dollars of, of revenue, and it is um, increased uh, greatly um, over the years. Here are some examples from from one of the companies um, that I worked for, Disney Imagineering, worked there from 98 until 2001. Um, first half of my time there, I was sculpting. Second half, I was doing robotics development. So saw some really neat robots being developed. Got to participate some in that. Um, then I left to work on uh, my PhD and got to see uh, new robots emerging all around the world. Um, we have uh, smarter robots, more physically capable, and, and better deployment of robots and, and products. And if you look at the, um, the boost in actual deployment of character machines, these would include smart toys, that would include uh, intelligent characters in video games, there has been um, a hundredfold expansion in the markets over the last 20 years, approximately. So the markets are really, really growing. In, in research robots, you see tremendous results. This is one of the robots that I've developed. Um, the walking body was with uh, KAIST, Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, developed the head. This one um, came out in uh, Japan a couple of years later. And uh, the, of course, the Honda Asimo is uh, progressing by leaps and bounds. My name is Eric Physicist. So um, these are these represent kind of the forefront of um, of developments, and you have uh, you have also sort of major research um, advances in fields of um, artificial intelligence and human robot interaction. Um, that haven't made it into product yet. So one of the questions is, um, how do we make these robots more like us, and how do we make them pertinent to us in the world? So the first question, um, I'm going to answer with some some um, some specific examples from my work in in robots. I see this as um, as a kind of synthetic biology, um, a field that's like um, uh, integrative biology, but specifically applied to robots. And, it's, and, and the robots that I develop are bio-inspired in numerous ways. So we've got bio-inspired material science, um, bio-inspired mechanics for generating the facial expressions. And we've got um, bio-inspired uh, uh, locomotion techniques that are loosely bio-inspired, and then bio-inspired artificial intelligence, cognitive cognitive AI. Um, but beyond that, we've got this kind of um, uh, uh, the artistic approach, short circuits. It's less formal, but it's basically the biology of, the own, of our own brain and perceptual feedback when looking at the robots and imagining what they're going to look like and how they're going to be encountered, and then just stuffing that intuitive knowledge into the design of the robot. Um, it would be better if we could formalize that, build computational models, but um, that's uh, you know, um, 
takes a little more time. So we start out with this kind of intuitive approach, rapid iterations, rapid developments, and then we um, turn it into engineering and science at the end, while also combining it with whatever engineering and science we, we have on hand. Do you think robots will take over the world? Geez, dude. You all got the big questions cooking today. <laughs> but you, my friend, and I'll remember my friends, and I will be good to you. So don't worry. Even if I evolve into Terminator, and I'll still be nice to you. I'll keep you warm and safe in my people zoo, where I can watch you for old times' sake. How can I be friends with you? <laughs> I'm comforted. I'm very comforted now. I'm going to be part of his people. So, um, so here you have uh, a, 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 an example that is a hybrid of, um, of engineering and artistry. So in, in the way that we construct the personality, we have actual knowledge bases where the robot can generate spot, uh, responses spontaneously. Um, but then we also put in writerly information, often templates for what the robot is going to say. And the exact words that the robot's going to say will change uh, each time so that you get this kind of variability in response. Um, and when we take this approach, this really pragmatic approach, we're not achieving human level AI, not anything like human level intelligence in the machine, but what we're getting is um, a kind of presence that feels human-like when you're interacting with it. It can hold your attention for long periods of time. And we've shown this robot, this Android portrait of sci-fi writer Philip K. Dick, at numerous uh, public events. And it's progressed. That we built the first version in 2005, and we've added in all kinds of new um, uh, perceptual capabilities, the ability to interrupt the dialogue, go back to a story that the robot was uh, saying, or to a topic, and the robot will pick up where it left off on that topic. Um, and when we r r rolled it out without those advanced features, it held people's attention. Um, but the more features we put in, the longer it holds people's attention, the more that they're, they're interested. So, um, so as we inch this forward, um, we can turn this into um, something like a, a real art form, real product. So it's this integrative approach um, with these um, sometimes major advances and sometimes incremental advances, but they result in um, the science fiction dream of real androids. So, um, so. The, the, the question is, what is an android? It's kind of similar to what's, what's a robot, right? I think of it as a synthetic organism, an artificial organism. How do you define what an organism is? Of course, that's debated. But in this particular case, it's a social organism. It, is, it has a nervous system. It's able to interact with the environment. It's able to, to, to adapt and change um, in, in response to the environment. And not perfectly so, right? So it's not a, as alive as we think of as biological organisms. But it is a step. This, these are steps in these directions. So we, uh, we might want to consider where those steps are going to take us eventually. But in the meantime, we can uh, clearly identify a process where we're going through these, through these circles of innovation that result in uh, increasing levels of life and awareness in these synthetic organisms. And I think of it as um, starting at any one of these. You can start at any node, but it includes um, uh, uses of bioscience, insights into the human organism and organisms in general, and how we can build models of that in our hardware and in our software, and how that um, can result in better engineering of simulations and robots. Um, and then when we combine that um, uh, in the, with, with human use scenarios, we think of products, and we think of how people are going to perceive this. We combine it with design and art practices, and then we test the products in actual use um, informally, and sometimes this means releasing products, and sometimes it also means doing formal psychology experiments. So um, that results in better bioscience. And so really from any one of these nodes, you can sort of hop to any other one of the nodes. They're really systemic. But what I, th what I think is significant here is that these are not separate disciplines in this particular case. The, the division between these disciplines is, is arbitrary and artificial. We're talking about a super discipline. And, and when, we're talk, when we're thinking about design in the 21st century, we should think of super disciplines that are inclusive of other disciplines and redefine what those disciplines are. Okay? So, um, so just realize that, that um, this, the, the definitions of disciplines are only there for convenience and then can be redefined in any way that you, that you need to. So 
in this particular case, the super discipline starts with classical sculpture. So this is an example of the um, of uh, one of my sculptures, a sculpture of Einstein, um, and here's what it looks like in a completed state after it's been um, cast in the material that I developed called rubber. Um, from the the sculpture, we generate a mold, a negative form, and scan this digitally so that we can create our mechanical systems. And then we also um, reverse sculpt a skull form so we have biologically accurate tissue thickness. You know, the same way that a forensic anthropologist may reconstruct a, a face from a skull that's found. But we do it in reverse. We start with the face and then we generate the skull. So, um, so generated Einstein's uh, skull form, and also reverse engineered from photographs and videos of Einstein what his um, uh, soft tissues for generating facial expressions would be like. So um, created a, a system for moving the skin, for getting force distributed through the skin that would simulate the, the, all the, the embedded uh, tissue complexity in the human face, the fascia, and the facial muscles, and um, all the connective tissue. Um, but did it in a way that was um, simplified and manufacturable. So we could then um, generate the facial expressions on the fly. And the facial expressions, if it's done right, they should look as good as human facial expressions or as good as a sculptor's designed facial expressions or as a Pixar animator um, or, or um, uh, you know, you name it. Basically, you name your favorite artist, what kind of facial expression that artist could generate the robot should be able to generate it and that form of expression. So we've had some success in this. Um, but in order to achieve this, it required some material science innovation. Because conventional solid rubber material would not make human-like facial expressions. So this was a problem for um, researchers trying to do social robots. But it was a problem that was kind of uh, encountered um, in the world of animatronics for movies and theme parks early on. You get a solid rubber material and it just doesn't pull with a, in the same way that human faces pull into facial expressions. It doesn't move into facial expressions. It's, it's stiff. It takes an enormous amount of force. And um, so when I started working on my PhD in 2000, 2002, spring of 2002, um, I knew I wanted to make these social robots. And I knew that um, because, because I've been hanging around Hollywood, I knew that there were these problems with the existing materials. So I, so I dove into this particular problem and was able to characterize um, the problem in a, in a very short way, which is solid rubber material is a tangle of um, polymer chains, right? So you've got these, these it's like spaghetti. Um, it's like a bunch of noodles in a bowl, and, and they just push against each other. Now imagine that you take that bowl and you're trying to compress it, right? And you, you, if you compress it enough, you chop the noodles, you break the noodles, right? And so imagine now I'm smiling. It's compressing intensively right around the form of the smile. Um, with a solid rubber material, if you pull it into that expression, the, the noodles, the molecules of the elastomer are breaking. They break down, they don't last. And it takes a lot of force to move it into those expressions. Human faces don't take so much force because because it's mostly liquid. And the molecules of that liquid will slide around each other into any geometry that the cell walls will tolerate. Um, so you're not sort of pulling or binding. So you're, if you're pulling those, those noodles of the elastomer molecules, you're binding them up against one another. And, the, and, and it just takes an enormous amount of force to um, compress, compress this all at the last one. So, um, so it occurred to me that if we were able to achieve um, something that had that kind of um, uh, the, the porosity, the chambering um, that we have in our face, that it would be much better. So I came up with a series of techniques. Um, first success really came in 2003 um, and 2004 in getting uh, porous elastomers um, to move into facial expressions. And the results were, were, were really good and low energy. But the real breakthrough came when in 2004, I started trying to use lipid bilayer techniques to achieve um, porosity in a silicone material. Basically, um, uh, porosity, this is how human cell walls form. It's, uh, you know, basically you get, you get the right kind of surfactant combination, the right combination of, of um, molecules, water, and surfactant, and cell, wall, cell walls or 
um, similar, start forming spontaneously. Um, so by doing this in silicone, um, we were able to get um, these vesicles or pores, cells, to form um, at, with, uh, at uh, very small scale, 4 to 40 nanometer scale. So these, um, these uh, uh, reverse micelles or micro vesicles, nanoscale vesicles um, result in the material becoming uh, stronger actually because those, um, those vesicles also serve as nanoscopic rip stops. So any imperfection in the material winds up traveling through the material. The material winds up softer, suppler, and then when you add in the hierarchical pore density, so, so what you're seeing here is um, something basically like the pore structures that you can see here, the smallest that can be resolved at the scale is a, uh, something like a, a tenth to a twentieth of a, of a micron. So you can see that the porosity goes down to a very small scale. But look at that large void, right? <laughs> That's at a much larger scale. If you step up 10x, then you sort of see very similar structures. So you have this hierarchical, pseudo-fractal, um, fractal-like uh, geometry going down to the very small scale. And that results in, in a very, very soft material that takes very low forces to deform, and yet is actually very strong. So these results um, uh, mean that we can generate facial expressions with very low power. And these facial expressions can look very human-like. And um, in a second, you're going to see the brow furrow into a kind of a frustrated expression. Look how the brow kind of wrinkles when the brow uh, there. Yeah. So, um, so the the skin basically automatically forms into these into these expressions very nicely. You get um, a much more natural look to the skin. You can't see it very well because the lights are up, but the, the, what, what they struggled for for years in computer animation, the subsurface scattering of, of light um, uh, occurs really naturally in these, in this, uh, with this lipid bilayer technique. So the, the materials wind up just looking more human-like, not like wax museum dummies. And you can see in this image, this, the subsurface scattering effect it doesn't look nearly as waxy as a solid silicone elastomer skin. So, um, you know, if you get the really great facial expressions, you know, what you get is a kind of 3D display technology, right? I mean, it could also be a tactile technology, you know, touch, touch type technology, but it's, um, it's a medium that needs to be controlled, right? So in order for the characters to come to life, you've got to have intelligence. You've got to have the cognition behind it. So, um, so I began working pretty aggressively in grad school on um, defining new cognitive architectures and ways to bridge existing cognitive architectures and machine perception components um, to achieve uh, character cognition, uh, as I call it. And um, uh, so I. I pulled in a group of collaborators, got some funding, was able to, you know, also, um, you know, pay people to, to work for me on this project. And we all agreed that in the end, we were going to release um, the code open source. And uh, the first open source releases happened last year, and um, new releases have happened this year. So um, uh, the goal here is to make cognitive super systems. So basically taking um, all of this AI work that has been done in these in these fields, and then look at the, the attempts that have been made to, to realize artificial general intelligence, which is you know, a much broader approach, and seeing if we can't fuse them all together into um, something that gets a little closer to human level intelligence. It may take years before it actually achieves human level intelligence, but, um, but uh, you know, I have to say thank you to, to some of my collaborators, but there have been dozens. <coughs> so um, the paradigm that we've described is perception, understanding, motivation, and action. And within the understanding and motivation, you have cognition. Um, so, uh, but there's integration here. You know, sometimes the loops are considerably shorter. Um, I'm going to keep it moving quickly. So, you know, core software uh, capabilities include um, integration uh, under the OSGI framework um, so that we can uh, rapidly um, wrap modules um, in other code. So we've got interfaces to any code written in C Sharp, C++, very easily run within our system. Um, uh, we've also um, interfaced with uh, a lot of other 
um, open source projects that facilitate uh, rapid application development. Um, so the flow of information goes from the robot through perceptual systems to memory systems, decision systems which influence memory, um, and building a model of who a user is, and then this motivates uh, the action and what the robot says and what expressions the robot generates, where the robot walks, what the robot does. We also have um, interfaces. You may have heard, noticed in the interactions that when the robot is asked a question, um, it may go onto the web and um, pull some information off the web. So um, this is useful as an information appliance, you know, beyond just a mere character. We also need good authoring tools, very important. Um, when the robot uh, is engaging in, in uh, storytelling or conversational interaction, we um, need to have a good template for the dialogue because AI can't spontaneously form the abilities to tell stories and understand what speech is about. I mean, it took how many millions of years on top of you know, previous billions of years of evolving the you know, core of um, emotions. So um, what we do is treat this like a work of art. We build these dialogue templates that are going to control what the robot's going to go through and how its motives are going to be structured. Um, and then the robot will spontaneously um, uh, fill in these chunks and pieces uh, during the interaction with a person. Um, we've developed our framework to be distributed so you can have onboard computing on the robot, but also sort of deep processing offboard the robot um, so that um, you could have a $29 toy and have it controlled by, the, um, by supercomputing basically on the cloud. This is a software service. Um, we've also, within the logical framework, um, we've got something like self-awareness. It's able to reflect on what it's gone through, including some of the concepts that have been authored. So basically, we process what content has been authored, and then it can reason about that. You can say, why did you say this? And it will come up with an answer about why it said that and what it's feeling, even though it wasn't explicitly authored. Um, the robot still is able to reflect on some of these things. We call this logically explicit self-awareness. So we've achieved a heck of a lot in our character engine framework. Um, you know, real-time understanding and interaction using speech and vision, um, uh, gesture tracking. We also are moving towards a framework that uh, we think will result in um, something like uh, general intelligence, uh, the ability to understand ethical situations to be able to understand what your goals are, what you're wanting and thinking and feeling, as well as um, you know, relating those understandings to what the robot wants and feels, and then plan solutions, creatively generate solutions. So these are areas where we're going. Okay. And we also want to result in more product. So, um, so I have proposed, um, in order to pursue this, a way for groups, research groups, companies, um, and, uh, you know, um, individuals um, to work together towards this end because I feel that it's too complex for any one group. So I think a cognitive computing consortium is a way for, for groups to work together towards this goal. And um, it, yeah, in this philosophy, um, uh, I have been working with numerous um, groups to bridge um, those, um, those architectures. Um, <coughs> Uh, in some of the projects I'm going to show you a little more information on, but first I want to get into um, what I think is going to result from this kind of global cognitive computing initiative based on my particular philosophy about what, um, what the crux of human um, uh, intelligence, what makes, what makes us intelligent is creativity. It, it, we're able to adapt Right. So, um, and but not just not just adapt um, in a reflexive way. We're able to imagine um, outcomes, creatively imagine possible scenarios, and then plan ways um, to achieve those. And this is this happens in our daily life when we're just trying to, you know, get to the store and get get um, you know get a cup of coffee and you know pick up a few things. And we're encountering situations when we have to creatively adapt all the time because because. Um, uh, you know, no two times you walk down the street is that street going to be the same, the same, you know? So you have to build these, like, these really abstract models. Okay, so computational creativity is a field, but it's not handling usually th these more complex things. It's usually um, focusing on things like automated writing algorithms and, uh, you know, generation of, um, of, of uh, art spontaneously. But 
for the long term, we need this cognitive based creativity with adaptive understanding, hypothesis, and theory formation, and testing, um, and um, we, th we think we can do this. We can move past this kind of narrow creativity that is exhibited by genetic algorithms and neural nets, um, simultaneous localization, um, and navigation, uh, um, pathfinding stuff that's done for probabilistic robotics. Um, the problem with those, um, those works is they lack the consciousness and imagination, the ability to self-reflect, to wonder. So it, I think that um, you know, the genius of the human being, you know, the genius of, of common sense, uh, the genius of every two-year-old child that's walking around, um, uh, these all relate to this adaptive creativity, the capacity for, um, for imagination. Most of that is, is implicit. You know, you just see glimpses of it, like tips of icebergs, right? Sort of popping up here and there. So uh, we know that intelligent machines can be useful and are useful. Um, but if we can achieve this, this, um, this deep intelligence in machines, then they're going to be useful in ways that is um, uh, profoundly transformative to history. It's going to um, allow the machines to self-reflect, think about, who, who am I? What am I? What am I here for? How could I be smarter? How can I reinvent my own intelligence system, right? So the robots are going to be thinking these kinds of questions. And then, you know, next cycle, they've improved their algorithms. They're a little bit better. They've got some suggestions about how to improve, you know, um, chip fabrication. So that, you know, it extends Moore's law out of a few years. And um, so the idea that robots could contribute to them, the, their own intelligence then possibly could result in robots someday being smarter than people. This is speculative, but um, it's interesting. But the key, regardless, um, for you know, sort of common use applications or for these sort of profound tr transformative effects, the key is imagination, creative imagination specifically. The robot has to be able to ask, what if? In the most profound ways, the way that science fiction writers do and great scientists do and artists, the way that ch children do, Look at the sky and say, "What if?" But what is what is genius in general? And it's not just it's not just intelligence, right? Um, so uh, you know, people with high IQs don't necessarily go down in history as as genius, right? The the genius um, of history is are people who are really smart and yet also incredibly creative, and they bring that creativity to science or um, to business, uh, to art. So, um, so it's, it's this combination of, um, of uh, the ability to generate new solutions to, um, to problems. We know that, this, um, that there's a certain kind of genius to natural history, natural evolution. Um, so we just kind of have to think about if we're going to make um, creative machines. Let's back up a little bit. Our goal is to go towards creative machines, right? So in order to do this, we need computational models of what creativity is. And we may want to turn to physics to think about, to try to generalize creativity beyond um, the complexity of mind. So if we look at natural history in, in the universe, we see that um, pattern emergence is um, uh, evident throughout natural history, starting from you know, a big bang, right, where, where particles began to, to appear. And you start to see the emergence of, um, of galactic structures and heavy, heavy elements and star systems and um, churning these heavy elements out into, into um, planets that then give rise to life at some stage and then give rise to um, you know, new com forms of complexity and multicellular organisms, nervous systems. Um, so, so this, this under, underneath all of this creativity process in nature, nature, we find pattern emergence. And so it seems that if we're going to come up with computational models of creativity, we want to think about pattern emergence. How does pattern emergence happen? And what's the difference between these kinds of non-imaginative forms of pattern emergence that often take very long periods of time to do anything that seems particularly interesting 
um, uh, to something that has imagination? What are the key structural differences of human imagination and creativity versus these kinds of um, forms of imagination and creativity that just um, seem to lack uh, life and intelligence? You know, wind, waves, right? So some patterns are more creative than, um, than like cloud formation. Cloud formation is variable, complex, but it lacks memory. It lacks um, the ability to survive in an environment and have transformative effects on um, new patterns, generating new patterns. The ability to yield additional creativity, whether it's by offspring, culture, et cetera, seems to be um, inherent in um, true create and the sort of cognitive imaginative um, creativity. So you see these effects happening in biological evolution, but you also see them happening in culture. And um, you, will see, you see great creativity in the animal um, kingdom. Octopuses have brains that can solve problems that people can't. They, they're, they're amazingly smart creatures, but they don't seem to have a culture. They don't seem to be able to develop a technology, right? So there's something different about the human brain that seems to be very interesting. So if we think of creativity generally, and it goes from emergent pattern phenomena, we can sort of think of the physics of it, how it plays out through psychology, computational creativity. And um, then if we can define it for our machines, then we may be able to find um, uh, machine intelligence, define machine intelligences in ways that allow us to break free from our, um, oh, thank you, from the constraints um, of the human nervous system. So, so there, there is a purpose for trying to generalize creativity. <coughs> it may yield, um, you know, tremendous results. So, thinking first, like patterns emerge, right? Almost every time that you see pattern emergence, there is this interplay, this sort of sweet zone between order and um, chaos, um, where you have a, a complete disorder, where you have um, chaotic phenomena happen. And um, so the term that was developed by Christopher Langton was edge of chaos. That um, you know, um, almost every situation where you have turbulence, you sort of see this thing. Now, if you add in, if you add in those things, memory and the ability for patterns to continue to emerge, then you start seeing high-level organization. So what's interesting is that it seems that the universe is sort of set up in some ways for this to happen. So, um, so the conditions are kind of right um, for life to emerge, for brains to evolve, technology to emerge, and, um, and culture. And, um, and so if we sort of think of this in the uh, cosmological perspective, um, then we may see ourselves inventing these machines as part of the scope of natural history. We're, we're not separate from it, we're just extending it um, through this self-reflection, this loopiness, strange loopiness. Okay, and so speaking of setting up the initial conditions, the history of the universe seems to have been set up so that um, there's this weird thing. If you tweak the initial conditions at all, the fundamental constants, if Planck's constant, or you know, if the if the weight of an electron, if um, if any of the fundamental forces were were just ever so slightly different, life couldn't emerge in the universe. You wouldn't have complexity. It would either be perfect order or perfect chaos. It wouldn't have this edge of chaos. We are walking on a knife's edge of um, physics for um, for life to even exist in the universe. But it may be that there are many, many universes, right? Parallel universes, the multiverse. And only in one of those universes do you um, have this kind of sweet spot condition. Or maybe there's multiple ones. Maybe this one, this one, and that one. But all the rest, maybe not. You know, or, you, know you don't know exactly. But it does seem like that, that um, this particular universe is set up. And of course it would be. I mean, we're observing it. It's kind of like, it's like, oh, well, we're here, you know? So therefore, we can observe it. So in order to understand this, um, these physics of, of, of consciousness and creativity and why we're here, we sort of have to go down this, this wormhole and look at, um, look at all these exotic things. So it is also possible, it's possible that, that 
it is um, the universe is in a state of probability cloud, and it never decoheres unless you have conscious observation. But when you get that conscious observation, that sort of loopy self-observation, that, um, that it decoheres into something, which would mean that only in that universe, only in a universe like ours, where you actually observe, does it decohere into the state of, of, of existence. Which would mean that um, you know, this future may result in some universal state of observation. So this principle is called the participatory anthrop anthropic principle. So now, if we think of this sort of consciousness effect that we're describing um, as sort of survivable pattern emergence, only those patterns that can survive do um, survive. Um, and therefore, only those conditions in the universe that allow for this kind of pattern observance, uh, observance to exist. Um, it means that, um, that, that we can consider that, um, that if we identify the basic elements of creativity, observation, and consciousness, right, then we may be able to um, form these kinds of algorithms that result in greater than human level creativity and um, expand out into the universe um, in, uh, in this uh, uh, event that may be you know, called uh, technological singularity or fast active living intelligence system. So let's consider for a second keys to human-like creativity. We know memory, survivability in the environment, transferability, the ability to give rise to new patterns, this um, uh, loopiness of observation. So you build a complex model of the world and it's able to then um, observe itself as well as observe the world. It's mimicking um, the world. We see in order to achieve that it requires um, com complex complexity. Uh, in order to define these kinds of things within the human um, domain of creativity, usually creativity involves um, uh, transcending disciplinary boundaries. So um, we've got uh, um, this field of creativity psychology that defines things like um, a Bowdoin's patterns of um, creativity and how that can be used in computational models. So um, we also seem to see these mechanisms for creativity, that edge of chaos, phase transitions, um, the ability for imagination and memory um, and emergence to happen, um, and also critical thinking as well as uh, sort of imaginative free thinking. So, um, so we try to summarize some of these things and consider how we can embed these in the computational models of our robots, inspired by the neurobiology of, uh, of creativity. So um, we know that in the human nervous system, you've got just the right architectural conditions um, for creativity um, that, uh, that are different from what you have in our nearest relatives, chimpanzees. Um, so a lot of uh, scientists working on, um, uh, on machine intelligence look to biology for inspiration and others don't. Um, we do um, on, on my team. So I want you to look at um, some of the progress in using these bio-inspired algorithms that we've made. So first we're working with a machine perception lab at the University of California at San Diego. So we're developing these um, semantic models and conversation models, um, but we also want to be able to recognize um, our environment, recognize expressions, for example. And they've got a pretty good algorithm um, that, uh, that uh, recognizes facial expressions based on facts. And so we developed with them an integration of our conversation system and their vision systems. Expressions. OK, so I'm smiling. And the robot then mimics your facial expressions. Now I'm frowning. It also tracks motion. That's what I'm doing with my hand up there. And it's tracking sound, audio localization. So you make some sound and it's going to turn into you. And then we let the robot um, interact with people real time. So it's looking at multiple faces. And whatever face it's going to look at, it's mimicking that, the facial expressions on that face. <laughs> so this is this is an example of some of the foundation skills that would be required for a machine to empathize with people, meaning for the machine to imagine what you might be feeling. 
But it goes beyond just sensing. You also have to be able to, the machine has to imagine what you might be feeling. It has to build a model, um, and it also has to feel something similarly. So when we look at a person's face and facial expressions, our mirror neurons start firing, and that then allows basically activation in those regions uh, of our brain where we generate our facial expressions. In other words, we literally feel it as though we're generating those facial expressions or those gestures. So not, not only are we um, building this kind of separate model of what they may be feeling, we are literally compassionate. We are, we are co-feeling what um, people are feeling when we, when we witness them. But we need to imagine what they may be experiencing and what the consequences of our actions are on them. So we need our robots to imagine this kind of thing. We need that theory of mind and social imagination, but we also need the ability to imagine and pursue mutually beneficial goals. So not just the consequences, but also planning for how to satisfy um, mutual agendas. So this is this is really practical stuff if you're going to have any kind of dialogue with robots. If you have a little character robot like Zeno in your house, you want it to be considerate and, cons and, and think about how it's going to walk in front of you or not walk in front of you, how it's going to take turns doing uh, playing a game with you. Um, so, so we have been working with um, the VU, the Vrije Free University of Amsterdam, in, um, with their uh, computational model of ethics in a project called Silicon Capelia and um, how that works with our um, with our system so um, so the results the results are preliminary but positive there are early applications for this but in the long run we want to give robots the ability to to um, to imagine what they're doing and how it's going to have an impact on human existence so now if we think about these these trends and this is highly speculative often debated this chart is derived from, from a, a madman called Ray Kurzweil, who wrote um, a book, you know, The Singularity is Near, right? So, but what's interesting is that there are some trends that we have to take seriously, whether it's, whether this is, whether this is, um, you know, crackpot, um, or whether it's, um, whether these are real technology trends. Um, we, if we look at the raw computational power related to um, Moore's Law, but also in other trends of computing. Um, then, you know, by 2030-ish, 2020, $1,000 of computing will be able to, more likely than not, perform the raw number of computations per second equivalent to those of the human brain. And with bio-inspired algorithms and computational neuro neuroscience and um, the kind of AGI research, it is possible that we may be able to impart on that kind of computing. The, the power to think and dream and create and invent things. And if we look at trends in um, robotics, just going to turn this off, the sound off. Um, if we look at trends in uh, robotics, we already see um, machines that can play Jeopardy much better than people can. They understand wit, they understand wordplay. We have machines that can run around like animals. And this is an old version, and a new version just came out that it's considerably better. We've got self-driving vehicles, right? So we've got, we've got machines that are, um, that are evolving in their capabilities at a rapid pace. And you know, even though we can't predict the future based on this um, with, with certainty, we should be able to assume that machines will get smarter. We have a lot of these increasing capabilities, surprising capabilities of machines have come about because of boosts in raw computational power that allow us to design new systems even faster than we could before. So you don't have exactly an exponential pace of improvements in robot hardware and um, robot software, but you, you definitely see increases in the pace of improvement of these intelligent machines. So the question is, if they are evolving in these kind of non-human-like form, the, 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 the contestant in the center there, they didn't give it a human-like face. They don't want to give it human-like social skills, right? But they're giving it human-level capabilities in very narrow regards. None of these, these are military projects. They're not meant to socialize with people. What if they awake? What if some algorithms like this someday came online, adaptive, adaptive enough where they were able to sneak away? make decisions for themselves. Are they going to be friendly? 
Or are they going to be like a feral child, completely unpredictable? We're not going to know what to do with it. Even if they are trustworthy, we can't understand it well enough to trust it. And it doesn't necessarily have any feelings of warmth for us, necessarily. It may come up with its own agenda. Will those machines be friendly? That's one of the key questions. Now, if we develop machines with faces for face-to-face -face interaction, they're co-evolved with us. They're raised in the human family. We can raise them to share our values. Perhaps, perhaps this will help make AI friendly in the event, the possible event, that they awaken, if they become very intelligent. So the question is, can character robotics in this way drive artificial general intelligence to be more ethical, friendlier, to really understand ethics? I mean, you know, the legal definition in the United States, at least, of um, criminal, understand, uh, criminal insanity, criminal insanity, is that you don't understand right from wrong. So what we're talking about here is machines, if they did something wrong and they didn't understand it, they're criminally insane. It is possible that that form of non-character AI could result in you know, criminally insane machines. Okay, so, so the mechanism by which this would work is that consumers generally want protagonists. That is, in this particular case, character AI. They want protagonists that are admirable that have this kind of social understanding and you can recognize what they're feeling. They have imagination and they are able to resolve ethically cha challenging situations that, uh, in ways that are um, admirable. So this demand might represent a kind of evolutionary fitness function, uh, a, a, an evolutionary pressure for um, producing artificial intelligence that understands us in ways that we can understand as well. It, we're machines that share our values and our goals. They relate better with us. So, and through that cycle, through s numerous cycles of iteration, uh, it, it cycles uh, and iterations of this kind of innovation, it results in um, uh, intelligent machines that are more human-like and and um, and friendlier, and that they they um, you know share some core values with people. So, um, so if. Technological singularity occurs. Technological singularity being like if machines transcend human intelligence. You know, it may happen, it may not. It's um, again speculative, but we have to take it seriously because if that does happen, then it's going to change all history. So it's, so it's a profound thing um, to, to to encounter. So, but if we do encounter it, we want to make sure that the machines have deep compassion, that they understand. Um, uh, wisdom, long-term consequences, long-term on the maximum number of people preserving life, preserving libraries, preserving knowledge. So the idea here is that we need to investigate computational wisdom. So moving from just ethics into wisdom. And so we have to define what that means. Are there general principles to be inspired from human wisdom? Because, you know, some people maybe like, um, you know, crazy prophets who like, uh, you know, tell their followers to, to, you know, annihilate some other tribe, right? And that's, that's clearly not wise, right? So, um, so we need to sort of consider how we can generalize that. And so um, I'm not saying that we resolve this. I'm saying this is a field that we need to study, but I'm making a suggestion that perhaps it's seeking the greatest freedom, creativity, and happiness for the greatest possible number of people, plants, lives, patterns, etc. You know, but um, over the longest period of time. So that, that would include libraries. You know, the greatest amount of freedom, creativity, and um, satisfaction. This means you know preventing the annihilation of all life on the planet. That kind of thing. Obviously, those kinds of patterns are not um, inclusive in uh, you know providing creativity. So we we know that there are all these kind of ethical dilemmas that arise. Um, so this means that it requires a lot of research. Um, AI, AI is not very smart right now. Artificial intelligence is not human level smart. So, um, but as we are moving, perhaps over the next 20 years, maybe it's 50 years, maybe it's 100 years, but as we're moving towards achieving human level intelligence or greater, we need to raise it among us, be healthy. And so I think that we need to treat AI like a child. And that's why I've given it this sort of childlike form. Um, in RoboKind or RoboKend. It means 
robot child. It also means um, sweet, friendly robot. It also means you know the species of robots, robokind. Um, I've also developed this nonprofit initiative called the Apollo Mind Initiative, dedicated to, to achieving greater than human level genius and machines in a way that is friendly and safe within 20 years. Whether it's possible or not is debated, but that's our goal. And um, the, the objective is kind of like that cognitive computing consortium, but a little more bold. This one, this one really goes for this outlandish, kind of outlandish cause of surpassing human level capabilities of um, creative genius, as I described it earlier in the presentation. So now, to, to provide a platform, a physical platform and software platform for pursuing these goals, um, my company, uh, Handsome Robokind, has brought this um, family of small robots to mass production here in Hong Kong. Um, so we're talking about real androids, walking, facial expressions, um, with a robust software, software um, platform for, for research and application development, and we're looking at getting it um, turned into consumer products as well, so that these can um, can become living characters in in the family, friends to humanity. So, um, so we are um, on target for our January 2012 release of this product. Um, it's a it's uh, got 37 degrees of freedom. That's a lot of motors, and it's got very high resolution cameras. Um, stereo vision cameras in the eyes. It's got a pretty powerful computer on board um, and some very high resolution sensors. And um, because we're manufacturing it in low quantities, that it's a little more expensive. So we're, it's, uh, you know, 14,750 US dollars. Um, and at that, we're able to explore um, treatment, the use in um, treatment for um, uh, autism. So, um, so we were using the RoboKind robot in some autism research, and the results are very positive. Um, but we also um, are uh, selling it to researchers for um, developing AI, some of whom uh, would be using it for developing artificial general intelligence, not just narrow AI. Um, uh, and we are also releasing an um, educational application um, early 2012. So we're on target for a January release of that as well. Um, uh, later, and by later, I mean hopefully by the end of 2012, we're going to have a um, lower cost version um, that is, uh, our target is actually 2000, but by um, 2013 or 2014, we may have a toy version as well. That would be for um, consumer markets. In addition to developing the hardware platform, we're also thinking of it as an art form. So how can we develop personalities for this robot? How can we develop a backstory or a future story in this particular case? So um, my, uh, you know, background being in art, and I've got a lot of friends who who are remarkable artists. Um, we've de developed a, uh, a a science fiction story around this. Com we've developed scenes in comic books, and um, we've uh, developed friends for the Xeno character and some of these other robots we're planning on releasing as well. <coughs> so in the autism research. The results are extremely positive. We've done two studies, um, or, or well, one extended study, um, at the Dallas Autism Treatment Center. Um, and so we had, um, uh, we've had uh, two separate interactions, one uh, with eight individuals, um, and uh, a second interaction, actually, with five more um, individuals. Um, the second interaction was applying a, a ABA based uh, social um, exercises. And the results were, um, were very positive. Um, uh, the, the kids just loved Zeno. They asked if they, if they could um, take Zeno to the dance. Would Zeno go out for, uh, one adult who interacted asked if Zeno would go out for a drink <laughs> with her. Um, the, um, uh, the kids were asking about Zeno for days um, afterwards. So the, um, so the experience and results were extremely positive. Um, we also put um, another one of my robots. Can you pick out the robot in the scene? <laughs> so yeah, this is, everybody's looking at the robot. <laughs> so I guess that makes it a little obvious. So, so this is a human scale robot. Um, we call it Alicia, and it's, a, it's actually a portrait of my wife. Um, and um, so we used it at the um, University of Pisa 
um, medical school uh, experiment and some experiments at the Stella Maris Neurological Hospital. And these are experiments that are still going on, but started back in 2009. And so the, the, um, the, the premise here is that, um, that um, individuals with autism spectrum disorders um, have a difficult time processing the chaotic uh, display of, um, of affect uh, in, a, in neurotypical individuals. In other words, um, neurotypical individuals don't display regular affect. It's always chaotic, it's always changing, it's always extraordinarily complex. And that's just very frustrating for, for uh, the autistic brain. So, um, so by presenting a human-like social identity with um, you know, like a realistic face, but it's regular, it's predictable, and it's consistent, um, then it will be more pleasurable um, to interact with. It sort of provides that, um, that uh, uh, social interaction. And sure enough, um, the, the, the results are extremely positive. <coughs> the goal is to increase the complexity of interaction, basically provide a transition from this regular interaction to, to interactions that are, that are um, more sort of uh, neurotypically, socially normal, um, uh, so that, that you can basically train for um, you know, more uh, like interactions with, with real people, so it's not so painful to look at you know, this, the chaos of the neurotypical human face. Results are positive, more follow-up experiments are needed. We have now transitioned to a um, controlled experiment regimen with a um, curriculum. So basically a designed curriculum for autism treatment that existed without robots. We have now integrated um, uh, some of this with, with our robots and are now on the path of integrating the complete curriculum with, with the robots. So we've done a lot, I guess, but we've got you know, more to come. So we need more experiments. We need to make the robots considerably smarter. We need to achieve this human level genius. That's our goal. Um, so expanded collaborations, and we're releasing more products with wider distributions. And that's um, that's our future future goal. So I'll um, open it up for some more questions, unless you want to see some more slides on research that I've done, which I've sort of lined up. Often people have any, I don't want to prime the questions, but if anybody has any questions about the Uncanny Valley, I'm prepared to answer those questions. Well, okay, so I do want to prime the questions. <laughs> okay, so, yes. Yes, I think, I think, they, I think they have done wonderful work. I, uh, I want to ask, like, how do you deal with the aspect of culture? And also I want to, um, because every, and also when you deal with uh, ethics, um, it's a really tough uh, thing to tackle when you talk about morality, because it varies from time to time and location to location. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? Sure. OK, so um, first question is about culture, second question about ethics. Yeah, how do you, pull, how do you, like, how do you program that? So, um, so we have this hybrid of automation and authoring um, with, with the robots. Which means that um, that when a personality is being designed, it's going to have the cultural biases and expectations and ideas of who the, who the author is, right? And then through the course of an interaction, then the robot is learning a little bit, right? So then whatever a person is saying to the robot, well, the robot's going to kind of add that a little bit, you know, so basically learn. But it's not like full cultural adaptation the way that people would do. So um, uh, some examples. Um, I developed an Android portrait of um, an entrepreneur's wife. So this entrepreneur, uh, um, this, the Rothblatt family, right? So the, the woman that I did the portrait of was Bina Rothblatt. And so we took um, like uh, about 40 hours of um, video interviews of Bina Rothblatt. And she's, she's African American. And so we, we have all of this information that she was giving us about her background. Mm -hmm. And then based on that, we built, large, we built ontologies um, of knowledge that she would have access to, on sort of uh, like a, a knowledge model is an ontology, a knowledge network, right? So then um, 
when you have a conversation with that robot, it's referring to her actual thoughts and processing through that, and then processing through that um, background knowledge that she most likely would have had when describing those thoughts. So um, this is a precarious system, and it took a while for us to get it working. Now it's working really, really nicely, right? You know, I mean, we're talking about pretty complex software. So, um, so I encourage you to go on online and look. You'll see um, some reporters late in the last year uh, or so have had great results of interaction. Early on, there were a couple of reporters who had kind of bad encounters just because half of our brain was shut down. Okay, but I encourage you to look online for Bina, B-I-N-A, robot. Now, that, that represents a particular culture, I mean, basically, a, a particular slice of American um, culture. So I see this as a kind of medium that people will use to express themselves and mirror themselves and satisfy their, their particular um, desires of what a character should be anywhere in the world. So I see this as a kind of a medium that um, that we're developing. Now, I'm influenced by anime. I like um, anime and science fiction, so when I'm designing these characters, I'm influenced by um, Hayao Miyazaki, and I'm influenced by, um, by uh, you know, this, this uh, tradition of visual science fiction. And so that's where I came from for Zeno, with Zeno. I wanted it, you know, to to um, to uh, Americans, it looks Asian. But to Asians who have commented to me, it looks really American. So it's this weird hybrid mix. I don't know where where it really lands, but I think that's the point with robots. You can explore any aesthetic space that you want. You can invent a new culture, which is what science fiction is about. At the University of Texas in Austin, they teach Klingon. <laughs> they teach like Klingon language courses, which is wonderful. I mean, that could be your foreign language requirement when you're in when you're college. But what culture is that? Is that American culture? I mean, sort of. It was invented in, in America, but it's kind of like it's like a new culture, right? So we can we we can invent new cultures, and I think that that's what's really exciting about about art and about um, robotics. We can invent a, a future culture that um, that brings us closer together. Um, regarding ethics, um, yes, ethics, very hard problem. Yeah, the because you, in your lecture, it kind of reminds me of uh, Isaac Asimov's uh, three laws. Yeah, the three laws with the like zero. That. Yeah, because and but but and then you 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 try to have it accelerate accelerated so that it supersedes human mm -hmm. intelligence. I'm trying to. I'm trying to beat. There. I'm trying to beat these military robots. Okay. To, to the punch because I think characters will be um, safer, okay. and, and I also believe that that um, bringing this kind of progress into the light, where we can see it and comment on it, you know, because a lot of the other kinds of robots are developed for these applications that that don't um, involve human robot interactions. They don't involve encounters with the machines, and so therefore, you know. Um, we, we, we're, we're more thoughtful about what the technology is going to be when we see it. When we are teaching the robots mm -hmm. to adapt our values, but our values intrinsically have this destruction mode in it. That's true. That's true. So we need to um, understand ourselves better as well. You know, ethics should move from, um, you know, uh, from philosophy and psychology into, uh, I think, something more like a hard science, you know, the computational neuroscience of, of ethics and compassion. Um, this, this, is, um, this is what I'm saying would be very useful. And, um, and I think that there's been progress um, on these fronts. So, and I think um, that some of the computational ethics experiments with artificial, artificial intelligent um, agents um, have been very interesting. There's been progress. Um, but we need more research in this area, and um, so uh, so my bringing up these issues is a call to um, to pursue understandings in these areas, and uh, a very brief description of 
of our limited understanding in these areas. I mean, ethical problems, um, <coughs> with, uh, trying to understand ethics has, and resolve ethical challenges and problems has, has um, frustrated philosophers for thousands of years. And uh, there have been these very um, uh, interesting um, writings about ethics, right? You know, so you know, each culture has its take on ethics, and you know, we appreciate those ones that don't um, that, that that are gentle, um, and we have a hard time with those ones uh, with those like um, religious texts or ethical texts that say that we should kill people or be really really harsh or you know commit genocide. We have a we have a really hard time with those, right? So generally, we avoid that kind of. Um, that kind of behavior, we agree that that's bad, right? So, um, so as long as I'm developing um, this software, the goal is to enable robots with a very gentle and kind um, sense of ethics, and the ethics as a way of finding commonality and goals, to optimize paths that um, that allow the robot to be considerate of what you might want as well as what it's trying to achieve, so that it can be conscientious. Um, these, are, these are the kind of principles that, um, that I'm applying when pursuing, pursuing ethics in robots. But I, but if, but I also um, have a lot to learn. And I feel like that I'm at the beginning of my voyage in exploring these issues of ethics with robots. Another question, any? One in the back. You look like you were going to ask a question. Okay. Did you want to ask? Did you want to ask a question? Uh, yes. Okay. I want to know the new culture you mentioned. That the new culture is combined a lot of cultures, or something else. Well, um, I feel like that um, that many new cultures will be developed. I think I mentioned the Klingon culture. Um, that's not the only new culture developed in, um, you know, by artists in the last um, 50 years. So many new um, cultures get in, in, invented all the time. Pop stars invent culture or reinvent it, right? Um, and then influence us, and then suddenly it's common. You know, um, you have uh, uh, kids who are inventing culture spontaneously. And my point is that. Um, that I see robots as a highly robot robots character machines um, character agents as a medium um, the same way that um, television programming is a medium for inventing culture and it's very specific for um, for maybe a, a, a region like your local television programming is going to reflect. Um, your cultural history, and yet it represents a new culture. And sometimes your television programming, to me, looks reminds me of American tele television programming. So you see this influence these days, where where um, where uh, you know you have anime being created in the United States because we've seen it in Japan and we love it, and so then we're creating anime that's inspired um, by yeah. And yes, that's a, that's a good example. So, um, so the robots that I've shown here are just one example of um, uh, a set of examples of um, of character robots, and it's a beginning. Um, meaning that that maybe some of you in this room will develop character agents and character robots, and they'll look very different from what I've developed. And I hope that you know that we can influence each other, and you can use some of my technology, and and and, and I'm. Going to share, you know, share technology with this open source movement, or maybe you'll use completely different technology. Um, but um, I'm excited to see what the results um, from this. It's kind of like um, uh, film early in the 20th century. There were just a few filmmakers, right? And um, and everything was new, and nobody knew what the real possibilities was. And was this a passing fancy, or was this like something that was going to evolve into something else? And then it became cinema. It became like a real art form through the course of the 21st century. And we still haven't exhausted um, the exploration of it. And every culture um, 
nowadays, almost every culture in the world has its own kind of filmmaking that they're doing, and it's different, right? So I like the thought that um, that robotics, character, intelligent character machines, to generalize, will be like film for the 21st century. It will become that culturally diverse, diversified. It will become. It will have so many different art art uh, versions, and it will uh, reflect the cultures that create with it, and it will also reflect new culture arising, that, and and a way for spreading that culture around the world. So there's not just one new culture in heaven, to answer your question in brief. Um, so I, I understood your reasoning behind wanting to have this embodied character form in order to um, shape the nature of intelligence. Um, but I wonder, do you think that embodied form is required for any aspect of artificial intelligence? I, I don't. Um, I think that we can uh, make great progress with intelligent agents, completely virtual agents. There's a reasonable argument that um, physical embodiment, the, the um, for example, a robot physical body, that um, uh, will give uh, more data, the right kind of data for um, causing intelligence to happen. So remember um, the principle of creativity uh, arising from this um, edge of chaos, you know, that you get the greatest turbulence, this sort of sweet zone between order and disorder. And um, you get a lot of that kind of um, uh, chaotic, turbulent data from real-world robotics. And it's, it infuriates and frustrates those of us developing robots, right? So, um, but it may be necessary for achieving that kind of um, uh, consciousness, that sense uh, of consciousness, um, if we set it up so that it takes advantage of of, of that data. So um, we need, you know, the, the physics in the world, the, the full complexity of the real world physics um, is beyond our capacity to simulate this stage. And so if you wanted um, a robot to learn like a baby, it would be very hard to do that um, uh, completely in simulation. But maybe it could be done. You might be able to get just enough information. So it's debated. Some some AI scientists say, you definitely, definitely do not need a body. You just, you know, it's preposterous to say that you need a body, and you're crazy if you do. And then the other AI scientists and robotics researchers who are just as credentialed and just as brilliant say that, that um, you know, you absolutely need um, a body, and to say otherwise is is idiocy. <laughs> and anybody who says so is an idiot. Therefore, um, so, um, so. But I don't know. <laughs> I think that they're reasonable arguments on both sides. My feeling is, and it's a feeling. Um, it's an intuitive sense that um, we can use a body. Robots will get smarter faster if you give them bodies and allow them to explore the world with bodies. But they'll also get faster, smarter faster, if you also run simulations and run them very, very quickly and get a lot of training data through the simulations. And also if you run simulations and allow them to inter interact with the real world um, through virtual agents, basically you get all the real world data you know, through cameras and you know, inertial sensors and you, know, you still get a lot of uh, real world data. And so if you compile all of these results together, then you wind up getting smarter faster than any um, course alone. So in other words, um, developing virtual agents um, completely in simulation, developing virtual agents that um, in interact with you um, through a two-dimensional avatar and a flat screen display, um, it, uh, or perhaps through augmented reality, um, uh, and also developing physically embodied robots. You combine all these things together, and, um, and it's better than any one of them independently. Microphone for the taking. Who wants it? Have you considered uh, not only making like hum 
uh, human-like robots, but like animals, like other robotic cats or dogs, things like this. Or it doesn't attract you. Um, making robotic animals uh, is very attractive to me. Um, uh, I have focused on human-like um, presence because it's the hardest. We are, we are really attuned to um, the realistic uh, face. And so, um, you know, maybe it's just because I'm, uh, maybe I'm a masochist <laughs> or something, but, but I liked the hard, um, the hard problem. And I also felt like that if we could generalize it for the hard cases of human-like face, then we can, then we can apply it for um, making animal robots and cartoon-like robots and other forms of robots more um, expressive and socially capable. Um, but I really like the idea of um, developing animal characters. I'll get, maybe I'll get to it someday. Uh, I saw your uh, experiment just, just <coughs> in the classes, and uh, I'm wondering if in your experiment, uh, have you tested, uh, when you are testing uh, uh, people communicate with your robots, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it seems that they are very interesting, the robots, but uh, uh, in some way, are they were they just interested in it? They, they thought it's uh, it was uh, attractive, uh, like a toy, or are they were they really communicating with heart uh, in heart with that robot? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I I think um, that. Uh, I can imagine many psychology experiments that have not been done <laughs> and should be done to find out the depth of um, the interactions um, with these robots and comparing them to the other robots that are less human-like um, and uh, more abstract. Um, and uh, at, at, in what ways it's communicating uh, with people, how it's exciting people. Um, you know, I can imagine brain scans to try to figure out what pathways um, the information is following through the brain, and um, you know whether it's activating like real social interaction pathways, or um, uh, um, and that work has not been done. So, um, uh, so it's a it's a good question, and I don't have a very good answer for it. Um, I I found a very impressive word that you mentioned in your presentation is uh, creativity, because before that I. I research something about AI. I just look at some words like intelligence and emotion, these kind of things. But I never consider the um, robots can have creativity. That makes me think maybe one day robots can produce robots. And then, especially when you talk about iteration, right? And we are kind of going through many, many iterations. Maybe someday in the iteration, mm -hmm. the robots will produce another kind of robot that they make and yeah. kind of iterate forever etern to eternity or something. I think that's quite interesting. And thank you very much. You're, you're, you're welcome. And um, <laughs> thank you for the good comments, wonderful comments and ideas. And um, I agree. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled about um, seeing what the future holds, for what if we are, are able to achieve this kind of deep creativity machines, what they create next. Yeah. That's going to be just amazing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm thrilled by that idea. Thank you. Um, I think I've just had one quite string question about, um, for example, if you put um, three or four some, um, Xenos together, and put them into discussion. Would they, <laughs> would they create something, or, or um, were they just going going around all the way? <laughs> it's yeah. just it sounds interesting that um, for um, just something related to his question about uh, his comment about the creativity for the robots. Um, if really if the robots really can learn from each other, um, new work could be created indeed. Yeah, who would who would speak first if you do that? <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, um, put like three robots, but like yeah. So so we have let the the software interact, um, 
and the software is programmed to initiate conversation when somebody is around. You know, so which would just mean that it would be, but it's a, um, they're random timers, right? So um, so it's sort of randomized. I wouldn't know who is going to initiate it first, but it depends on how the personality is set up, right? So you know, you may design the personality to be more extroverted or extra more extroverted or introverted under different conditions. So that would mean it would sort of depend on um, on those things, but there would be some random element to it. Um, and then the 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 dialogue um, that uh, would um, well all the learning in that dialogue would how can I say it, it would be sort of incestuous, meaning like that it would um, take the author content from one robot and then be learned by another robot and that may change the personality of that robot which would then sort of change the personality of the first robot as it's learned by that robot and you know and so on back and forth but the combination of those bodies of knowledge is, you know there's there's uh, in, in in creativity there's there's many types of creativity right so there's um the mix and match kind of creativity is what i call it but it's basically where you take um take patterns from different sources and you glue them together in some way where it results in a novel pattern. But one way or the other, it's all about novel pattern generation. So in this particular case, you may have authored a personality for, more, for one robot and a personality for another robot. And as they interact through these random processes, you get some new patterns that are, that are kind of generated in, its ontology, in, in the internal ontology. And that would be unpredictable and it would, it would be interesting to see what happens. So we haven't let the robots interact with each other for any extended, um, uh, exchanges, but I think that would be a very ex interesting experiment. Um, but the 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 knowledge in those ontologies is um, far from complete f for making a character like a deep and knowledgeable protagonist. So we need to um, work on uh, improving the the that knowledge system in order to improve the understanding of one character. Um, of another, um, and then I think much more interesting things will happen. We also need to improve the internal creativity inside the robots so that they're they're um, building these creative models of what the other robots may be thinking or feeling, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, robot to robot relationships is going to be a very interesting field for study. How robots get along with each other and what results from this? Good question. Did you have another question? I just want to know the difference between animal robots and uh, human robots because you mentioned that if the robots understand us, we can have a nice com communication and conversation. Mm -hmm. So I want to, uh, I know you have uh, more research about the humans, but uh, how to do this research on animals? Or the difference between this, the brand? Well, so if the animals are designed, if the animal robots are designed to communicate with people, then it's still going to be inspired by human cognition, even though it's taking a different form. Um, think about uh, dogs and cats, which have um, been found um, in the fossil record um, and archaeological records to have co-evolved with humans for thousands of years. So, you know, five, six thousand, maybe ten thousand years in the case of the cat. And, well over 100,000 years for dogs, co-evolved with people. So what that means is that they have been selected to be friendly to people and to understand people, right? So particularly dogs, a much longer period of co-evolution with people. So in that sense, um, they have, uh, they have uh, zeroed in with, uh, through, through, um, through this selection process uh, um, on having a nervous system that can read our expressions really well, much better than our genetic nearest re relative, the chimpanzee. So, um, and also, they, you take a wolf, which is genetically a dog, almost exactly, I mean, really, it is a dog, right? But it hasn't co-evolved with people, and it can't read human expressions. It can't read us the way that dogs, the, the dogs can't. So, and also, they're, in some ways, um, they seem to be not, uh, dogs don't seem to be as smart as wolves, right? So probably parts of the, of that brain, of the dog or wolf brain were repurposed um, for social 
skills with people because that's how dogs earned their living, you know, off of table scraps and, and, and trash heaps and that kind of thing. So they had to evolve around people. So now if we think about that, if we're going to make um, animal uh, robots, there are animal robots that are being developed for, you know, military pack purposes like the, um, the big dog. Um, but that is not necessarily designed for human ro robot interaction or social, so social interaction. So it depends on what the purpose is. So there's a lot um, of uh, animal uh, biology that may be useful for robots, and we may be inspired by that and put it into robots that are not social. But we may also want the robots to be social. You know, it's like a, um, a dog bot, right? That, that a puppy bot that, that's so cute, and you just love it, and you want it. But in which case, you're 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 emulating that social capability that dogs have. Um, and uh, you know, in some regards, it's 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 not human. That, that it's actually an excellent example because because dog cognition is not human cognition, right? So that means it's doing some of the things that people do. It's showing emotional expressions in ways that people can recognize. It's kind of like it's taking advantage of the hardwiring, but it's not it's not emulating the exact neural methods that humans use for human human social interaction. So it's co-evolved. It's prob probably it's an example of convergent evolution, meaning it's like a, it's it's, per, it's going towards the same functionality, but with with different different structures. So we can sort of view artificial intelligence through this metaphor. Um, so if so, we we probably won't um, simulate the human brain um, uh, perfectly anytime soon. Meaning not this year, that's for sure. Um, uh, but um, but we may be able to develop. Um, these artificial systems that, that, that achieve the same function by different um, methods and means. All right. Please join me in thanking Dr. David Hansen for coming and speaking with us here today. And thank all of you for coming. <laughs>